Right. Well, there we go. Hello, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Morgan. Uh, thank you so much for doing this interview. Please call me Jennifer. Okay, I will. <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Egbert Born. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations on your appointment in January as an executive uh, director for Greenpeace International. Today, uh, our focus will be on the Greenpeace ships in relation to climate change and on international policies for the shipping industry. Mm. But before we go there, uh, could you briefly, like in two minutes, introduce yourself to our uh, viewers? So what are your experience before you've got uh, this job when we talk about uh, climate change? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thanks Thanks for coming over and thanks for the chance to, to talk to you and volunteers. Um, I come from a climate change background, activist background. I've worked for a range of different organizations on trying to get, well, climate change laws in place nationally, internationally, in the U.S., in Europe, internationally. So that's really where I come from, uh, is trying to make change on slowing down climate change, halting climate change. So that's about everywhere. Yeah, that is and, about everywhere. And what, uh, which country uh, is where you, where you born? I was born in the United States, yeah. um, but been living back and forth between the U.S. and mostly Germany, German speaking. I speak German and, oh, okay. and have a German partner. Yeah. Uh, so I'm uh, a bit of a transatlanticist. Okay. Yeah. Well, I read a lot about your career uh, with always the focus on uh, climate change. As an example of your long history, uh, you've already been leader of the climate change uh, delegation in 1998 at the Climate Summit in Tokyo. Uh, can you share what was the first moment you decided to uh, dedicate your uh, life on taking action on preventing uh, climate change? What was your mm -hmm. basic motivation? I think my, my the first moment was actually going into the Earth Summit so it was before I worked on climate change, actually, where I saw what the what was happening to the planet. My yeah. sister actually is a scientist, so she was. We were talking quite a lot about yeah, on what subject is she a scientist? Uh, she is a botanist. Oh, okay. And she works in marshes, and she's actually doing work on the impact of climate change on marshes in, oh. in the U.S. Yes. So she's on the ground, and I was observing what was happening on the, the Earth Summit and what the Bush administration was not doing at that time. Yes. And uh, to be honest, it was a bit of a feeling that, the, that, the na that nature, that creatures, and that people were impacted by this massive change were not being represented uh, by the Bush administration at that time and in Rio. And that's when I thought I need to get in engaged somehow. Uh, so it was a bit of a combination of personal and the political that catalyzed me to start looking around and see what, what I could be doing. Is there also like uh, something, um, like for example, for me, uh, several things triggered my interest in climate change, but uh, I remember one holiday in Greece where I saw the snow uh, much higher than I expected based on uh, uh, photos from 10 years before. So then it was happening. Uh, before your eyes. Before your eyes. No, I, I have had a number of those types of, of experiences of, you know, birds arriving yeah. um, at different times of year when their food's not available and you see the impacts there. I was up in Alaska yeah. uh, a number of years ago and was in Glacier National Park and just seeing uh, in Montana as well and seeing the, the reduction of glaciers. Yeah. So definitely seeing it with my own eyes, but then also just learning about the, the science of it. Okay. Well, to give our audience a sense of the people you work with, I read on Twitter you consider uh, Barack Obama as a friend. In oh. other publications, uh, you uh, gave advice to uh, former uh, British Prime Minister Tony Blair yeah. and to German uh, Chancellor Mer Merkel. Um, yeah, how is it like and uh, do they listen to you? Oh, gosh. Well, I, I have... Um, I follow Barack Obama. I yeah. uh, can't say that uh, he's a. When you I met hear him? friend, I have not met President okay. Obama. I have spent time with um, Chancellor Merkel and with with uh, Tony Blair. I have found them in the personal. Well, let me talk mostly maybe about Chancellor Merkel. I actually think that she personally, as a scientist, really understands climate change. She was in Kyoto at that first meeting. Oh, okay. Of the. Uh, the third meeting, actually, of the Conference of the Parties um, yeah. there in the international negotiations. 
And you see, I think, in these figures of, it depends on who it is, but I think the ones who understand the science, they have this dilemma. Yeah. Because they know that the clock is ticking. They know that we're fundamentally altering the planet. And yet they are facing this political system that just can't, that is very difficult to turn around rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there the key thing is just to make sure they know how much power they do have. <laughs> you to come back on politics later on. Uh, first I want to uh, do one uh, last uh, question on the introduction. You yep. spent time on the Arctic Sunrise this yep. year. Yeah. That's the icebreaker of the fleet of uh, Greenpeace. Um, yeah, what uh, was an impressive moment for you when you were there? Or what what uh, can you share? Well, I felt um, there were so many different things, but I, uh, well, first being in the Arctic itself and the silence of the Arctic, and then being on my first tour, ship tour, I felt like, I actually felt like I had arrived at ah, Greenpeace. Okay. You know, I had just been through an executive director's meeting with all the executive directors, which was great. But actually arriving there, I felt, uh, now I'm here. Yes. Because it's such the core blood and heart of the, of the organization. So it's pretty emotional, actually, looking out into the Arctic and being on this amazing ship. And, and what was it like to be with the crew? Oh, uh, they were great. I, uh, I learned a lot from them because I am not a ship. I mean, I've been on ships in my life, but I yeah. have never been, you know, watched. Oh, operational ship. Exactly, an yeah. operational ship like that. Yeah. Uh, so I learned a lot from them. I um, and I just found them all so committed, um, huge expertise, and just really great, welcoming people. Yes. <laughs> it was great. Okay. Well, we go to chapter two, the climate change. Yeah. Uh, Greenpeace International has its office here in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, and many people from abroad live under the perception that uh, Netherlands is a front runner when you talk about uh, renewable energy. Mm -hmm. But uh, in fact, it's uh, it's the contrary. It's like only 5.8 percent renewables at the moment. Uh, we, the, you could say a sea level rise is for the future existence of the Netherlands uh, is a big problem if you continue this uh, pathway. So what, why, why should uh, Dutch politicians take this as an incentive to speed up their action? Well, I think they should take it as an incentive. They should be, you know, if you're a politician, you should be looking at the well-being of your people uh, and your country. So I think looking at the science, looking at sea level rise, looking at increased storms, frequency, clearly there is a gap between what the politicians understand could happen to the Netherlands and yeah. actually what they're doing about it. Uh, so that's where I, I actually, you know, that gets into power and politics, et cetera, because they need, they, there's either not enough of the public pressure there and too much yeah. pressure coming from other places so that they're not acting because it's staring them in the face, right? Um, do, you, do you feel that they are fully aware that it, uh, it takes like 35 or more years uh, to get uh, the effect of the carbon emissions uh, into the system? I so that what we do now is, is uh, or is it that it sometimes I feel it, like they don't believe it? I, I also have this weird experience where it, there is this belief thing, yeah. and instead of understanding that this is science, yeah. um, and it, it may be that they're a bit in their own denial because mm -hmm. they can't face what it, what it means, it mm -hmm. may be that they don't have the right facts, it may be that they're under political pressure from somewhere else, but yeah. no matter what it is, there's clearly a lack of leadership yeah. in um, really putting this front and center for the, the country and the future of yeah. the country. Greenpeace did a long uh, and in the end successful campaign to keep Shell away from uh, drilling in the Arctic region. But uh, this week in the Alaska newspaper, Alaska Dispatch News, there was uh, two articles. One uh, about shocking uh, coverage about uh, record temperatures. Mm -hmm. And the second was about the new uh, Natural Resource Commissioner of Alaska, Mr. Andy Mack. And he said, uh, plans to take an aggressive approach to encouraging a boost in oil production, which provides more state income. So we can say, in spite of the Paris agreements, local politicians in many countries keep focused on their short-term gains and on uh, austerity measures for the local economies. So what do you expect from national leaders to, to uh, get Paris into the hands of the, the local leaders? 
Well, I, gosh, there's so much there. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, even on the local level, I think there is an expectation. I mean, if you take Alaska um, and the impacts that are happening to Alaska from climate change, I mean, it, it is phenomenal. And the communities that are moving, you want to talk about climate refugees, there are climate refugees in Alaska and in the United States and all around the world, right? It's not just a, 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 an issue clearly that's happening in developing countries, but it's mm -hmm. there. So, but your question, I think, is trying to get at the kind of the accountability around Paris and how you get that down to the national level. Yes, and then, exactly. And I think there's, um, well, there's a number of things there, you know, within the agreement itself. Okay. There, um, there are accountability measures in there as far as what countries are supposed to be doing, how they're supposed to be reporting in. They're, they're, they, ha they took a commitment to actually phase out their emissions to zero by mid-century. Yeah. And they're reporting on that every two years, and there's a global check-in to see if they're meeting that every two years. Yeah. But I think this is actually a place, because it wasn't possible to get really hard enforcement measures in Paris, yeah. where where citizens, where people have to play a really big role in holding countries accountable for yeah. what they've signed up to. And that gets down into, you know, the, the local and the national level, because we know that's where these things actually happen. Um, Let's talk about ships. Okay. Yeah, we come back on the politics later, so yep. no worries about that. No, don't worry. Uh, but if you look on the future of the shipping fleet of Greenpeace, uh, it makes sense. Uh, Greenpeace should lead by example. Yep. Well, the Rainbow Warrior is a very uh, modern ship, very uh, beautiful also if in terms of uh, yeah, uh, sustainable. But uh, if we move forward to a low carbon emission or even a fossil free fleet, then uh, for the Esperanza and the Arctic Sunrise, it's a different story. And if you uh, look specifically, sorry, I rephrase, specifically on the icebreaker qualities, that makes them more. Uh, expensive mm -hmm. to uh, get a better ones. Like for example, the US announced last year they want to build a new icebreaker that will cost one billion dollar. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. So, uh, yeah, how do you look on that for the future for the, the ships of uh, replacing Esperanza and Arctic Sunrise? Well, Is it possible to get an icebreaker again? Well, I think, you know, First of all, just to say, you know, ships are core of what Greenpeace does, and yeah. so having these ships in the future is, you know, is a given. Um, as far as their performance and their efficiency goes, right now, you know, there we do have good, I think, policies and regs in place that actually we are ahead of what we would be required to do, but it's not enough yet. And so with the sunrise, I think what we're looking at now is it goes, you know, go is going into being um, refabbed is where there are opportunities to be even more efficient uh, on that. Similarly on the Esperanza. And, and the, this is always a balance, right? So yeah. how do you have a ship that is fast enough to get away from someone or is fast enough to, to follow um, fishery, you know, fish fishing boats that are deep, that are trawling, yeah. while being as environmentally sustainable as you can. Yeah. And that's a balance that we're working on. I think the level of investment is one you're asking, and I think there's a commitment to invest. Um, and the question is when you do that and how you do that. Um, but that's, um, you know, I think our, vision is to have those ships there, the Esperanza is actually up next year to kind of look at, okay, what happens exactly on that. I was talking to the captain about that to get his thoughts on that as well. I also uh, heard uh, some discussions screen be shoot in the uh, future diversified fleet. Mm -hmm. Instead of having three ships, uh, each doing all jobs uh, all, uh, spread all over the world, like the research, action and awareness campaigns, uh, you should also uh, could think about go for five ships with specific tasks, so and then maybe smaller vessels, so that the cost per vessel is uh, lower, and also you have uh, yeah more options to uh, to reach the end public and do the research and do the actions at the same time. What what's your opinion on this issue? Well, I think you know Greenpeace just actually agreed a ten-year strategic framework uh, for the whole organization, as it and is in the process of now 
getting that down into kind of set goals and campaigns and that type of thing to, to evolve moving forward. And as part of that, there's going to be a, there is a discussion about how, you know, how best to integrate ships and what kinds of uh, ships do you need. I think, you know, I think we need to use the ships in a way for all of those different purposes as we do now. There's yeah. research, there's education, there's awareness, there's actions, you know, all of that. You know, um, and be smart and pragmatic about it. So I don't have a specific answer. Is it five? Is it three? Is well, it two? Right? Um, but you recognize the discussion and uh, say, well, we are. Uh, but it. But it's clear that the ships can remain in this new strategic framework a core part of what we do, and it's clear that it's a big investment for us. So finding what make how to match those up in the next year or two to figure out, okay, do, you know, also looking at the investments and that have been made. Yeah. What's the best makeup, I think, is a good moment now to step back yeah. and to do that. The, the, uh, in the, uh, the shipping industry in general, they are also thinking about new generation with uh, onshore and offshore facilities. Right. And this is not yet a, uh, in the, those ships of three piece. So uh, I can imagine uh, this is also uh, Part of the decision-making process: uh, Do we want to uh, re, uh, refurbish them, or do we want to uh, uh, think on the long term for uh, a new one with, uh, yes, a top uh, top of the bill, new new technology? That's exactly the debate, I mean, yeah. and that's a debate that is a big one. And so, where the the crew and the ships and the finance part and everyone else needs to be involved to make the best decision for the organization. Yeah. Okay, now we go to the somewhat of questions about the international shipping policies. Okay. Uh, United Nations plays an important role, and uh, one candidate for the new uh, Secretary General is uh, Ms. Uh, Christiana Figueres. She has a long reputation on uh, climate change. Uh, you, you met her? Yes, I, I do know Christiana Figueres. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, I read a lot about her in this uh, book of uh, Jeremy Leggett, mm. winning of the Carbon War, and he was really also admiring her. Yeah, her. she's a very, yeah. very yeah. inspirational person. Uh, if you look on the severity of the climate change problem, do you think uh, she is uh, for the United Nations uh, now the obvious candidate in this uh, time frame? Well, I think the next Secretary General has to have a person who has a lot of experience on climate change, uh, and because the next, this term, in a way, are the, the pivotal years that we're going to cross tipping points of no return, we're, you know, in, in, uh, on the planet from climate change. So, having a person with her experience there, yeah. I think would be the best, yeah. absolutely. Um, and it would send a signal that the United Nations and the countries in the United Nations actually understand that climate change is one of, if not the, major peace, security, environmental threats that the world is facing. So you need somebody who knows how to, how to uh, approach it. Yeah. Well, uh, if you look on the ship's policies, the uh, International Maritime uh, Organization, uh, I'm always the, the, the most important one. And in the first quarter, they announced the so-called intended IMO determined contribution. Mm. They were not uh, part of the Paris Agreement. They managed to get out of it. That's right. And then later on, um, they weakened the announcement of this uh, IMO uh, determined contribution. Uh, are you optimistic that this uh, intended IMO determined contribution will be incorporated in the next uh, climate agreement, uh, mm -hmm. like for example, the next important COP uh, in 2018? Well, first of all, I think we have to get our heads around and, and the arms around the, um, the sector. The ocean is another one which is just not covered by these international agreements. And I think it would make sense that that could, would be part of the discussions in 2018. Am I optimistic? I think we have a lot of work to do to make that possible. Yeah. And make that happen. Because thus far, that, that you know, Maritime has managed to just avoid the attention and the pressure on government to bring that sector in has yeah. not been high enough to overcome the opposition that's kept it out. You make a very nice bridge to my next question. I also talked to some people uh, not thinking all the questions myself. So I received one uh, very nice question from the audience about the team uh, mobility and transport. Mm. 
Uh, if you look back from the last decades, focus on Greenpeace has been on protecting nature. And she said, uh, should we not, if we want to save uh, the world, focus on mobility and transport and to uh, cut the use of fossil fuels fast and dramatically? So, is it necessary for Greenpeace to transfer uh, from uh, saving nature to uh, saving the human race? Uh, specifically focusing on uh, transport, sea transport. What do you think? Well, I, I actually think you can't separate those two out. Uh, I mean, humans and nature are, we are deeply entwined. Yes. Right? So, and humans are dependent on nature, although the inter they might not realize it all the time. So, I think we are working on helping save the human race and working with people in order to avoid the impacts of climate change on people and on nature. Um, so I don't see it as an either or. I think we, we need to be doing both and we're working to do both. I agree that nature is, of course, is the, the, yeah. the basics of uh, the human beings. But uh, uh, if you focus on the transport specifically, that, yeah, that will uh, give a different uh, type of action. Sure, but well, we do work on transport and on the things that humans care about. So yeah. uh, whether that be on mobility, yeah, you know, mobility. I know we're talking about ships here right now, but well, yeah, ninety percent of uh, the the trade worldwide is done by international shipping. Right. right. So that's that's a lot. And uh, recently there was a discussion in the Dutch Parliament. They saw the movie uh, Sea Blind from the climate journalist uh, Bernice Notenboom, mm -hmm. who uh, he also uh, showed how bad the influence is for the, for the climate. And uh, the politicians, they saw it, then they had a meeting, and in the meeting they said, what a great movie, and then they turned back to uh, politics about inland shipping. Well, 90% of the danger is coming from the oceans. Right. Speaking about mobility and transport, so right. and I thought, well, since Greenpeace has international ships, mm -hmm. that could be a specific uh, task or role, if you... Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different levels of what you're talking about. I think there's working on transport in the fact of supply chains and how things get... I mean, it's linked, actually, to the kind of economy we have. Yes, yes, yes. Very much so. Yes. So there's, you know, whether you work on international conventions on the IMO, that's one approach. I think one of the things we are looking at right now is how to get uh, new forms of economic development moving forward that are more localized, that are more close to people, yeah. that would have an impact on the full supply chain and therefore on the way that we organize goods and services and transport around the world. So it's a little bit of a different coming in at it. Um, and I think you're right to point out the role of international transport and mobility. I, th the, the, I think the approach we've been looking at more is what's the way, what, what are the drivers that are creating this very globalized world and economy that we live in? And yeah. how can we as Greenpeace be trying to bring about some changes that number one, you know, uh, the pro what's important to people as far as stuff or, um, or people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's one example. Yeah. Um, which, those are the underlying causes. You know, uh, we're really trying to look at the root causes for for these emissions, whether it be in, in the national transport sec sector mm -hmm. or whether it be um, in, in energy, um, yeah. the energy sector, and then trying to, and then finding the levers that you can kind of turn that would then bring about systems change. If we have an environmental goal that's there, which is around reducing emissions in this sector and really yeah. taking a hard look at it, yeah. then how do we change power dynamics? How do we change mindsets? What can to actually achieve that? Yeah. Um, and that then can be around. Act, we can use actions to do that. We can use um, ships to do that. We can use um, activism and lobbying to do that. Um, so it's it's trying to get at that problem in a way that ends it and just doesn't stop one thing, but actually tries to get at the whole system. We have a few minutes left, so I will um, speed up a little. Yep. 
but uh, there's still some important questions left. Always more than I uh, can ask, but yeah, still sure. uh, some I don't well, like to skip. So um, one thing is the due to climate change, the Northern Sea will uh, open. Yeah. And uh, many countries are already speeding up to uh, go there. Uh, is the rising political tension between Europe and Russia uh, problematic for Greenpeace to, to make sure this uh, Northern Sea will be a climate uh, responsible uh, passage? Also, I've also thought about there's about no infrastructure and there is uh, the light and day uh, situation and also, well, you name it, you know it. I mean, there's tensions all over the place, whether it be between Europe and Russia or other places. I think what now what we're working to do is to tr to get that part of the world protected. Yeah. Um, so one reason why I was up on the Arctic Sunrise was as part of a campaign to try and get a protected area yeah. up in the Arctic seas. Yeah. Um, because because the ice is receding, there's no protection there anymore because the ice was protecting the, that part uh, of the seas before. Yeah. So, yes, I think that there are, you know, it, the increased tensions and who, who gets to claim the, you know, the North Pole and all of those questions, I think, are highly relevant um, and make it even more urgent that we get those seas protected. Norway is actually a really important country in all of that right yes, now. Yes, also for the lobby. Um, and because of, yeah, the way that that works, and also there's a negotiation on the high seas happening right now to try to get those areas protected. So, for me, the conflict brings even more urgency to get, get that area part of the world off, yeah. just off limits. Off, yeah. Off limits. Okay, well then, what uh, is your opinion about China's uh, leadership on, on uh, climate change adaptation? Well, on adaptation, I think that no, there, are, I think that the Chinese um, leadership is pretty aware, actually, and has been for some time, of the impacts of climate change yeah. on them, on their country. I think the most predominant one that I have found that comes up is the impact on agriculture. Yeah. That you could lose two thirds of your of their food production from climate change impacts. Yeah. So, um, and I, I think they are starting, and they do have adaptation projects underway. Um, how thorough those are, I think, you know, it, well, is up to debate for, for, for everybody. But I, my sense is they're aware of the impacts. The decline of the coal emissions is due to a range of factors, but climate is one of them. And their intent is really to move into a much more adaptive, um, innovative type of an economy. So more to do, um, more to make sure that people who um, are living in those impacted areas are actually, you know, that there's resilient, that they're taken care of, that there's plans there. Yeah. Um, but I find that the Chinese are actually quite aware of a lot of these things, maybe more aware than some other countries are. Okay. Then we have the last part on the feasibility. Um, uh, last year on the Climate Summit in Paris, I met uh, Bill McKibben from 350. He's always making strong uh, opinions on activism and also has no problems with getting arrested. Mm -hmm. But uh, and also they, the 350 played an important role in the negotiations to getting the D12 uh, demonstration legal. Mm -hmm. What uh, we heard from several countries is that uh, there was an active uh, uh, message from Greenpeace International to the to countries that they should not officially uh, engage in the D12 uh, demonstration. So, yeah, uh, for me it was like uh, uh, we won uh, the, uh, the demonstration back due to the heavy pressure of 350 and I was a bit surprised that we uh, heard this, uh, this uh, signals. Hmm. Uh, wh what, is your, what can you say about it and is, was, is, that, is it true or is it, was it a good decision or? It's a bit before my time, um, yeah, that's but my understanding um, I mean, Greenpeace supports activism, you know, across across the board. Nonviolent, obviously, direct uh, yeah. activism and action across the board. Um, and I know that was part of the co the coalition's um, 
around the different um, mobilization moments and demonstrations in, in Paris, before Paris, and after Paris. So I don't think that has changed um, at all. I mean, I don't know the details of what you're talking about, so... Yeah. Okay, I, I can understand because it was just before you uh, came into the job. Yeah, I came in in April, actually. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's an interesting yeah. rumor. I'll check it out. We are already uh, over time, so I conclude with one uh, simple final question. Okay. Uh, if you meet somebody, uh, just a total newbie, yep. considering to be a volunteer for Greenpeace, because uh, this uh, he or she is concerned about climate change. Yeah. Uh, what would you say to motivate this uh, person or to encourage the person to uh, volunteer Greenpeace? Or um, how, or just, yeah, in general, or like for volunteering for Greenpeace? Well, I think. Final words. Uh, first of all, I would say that the future of the planet and the climate is going to depend on whether people engage to make, it, to make, make things different than they are right now. Yeah. That the power balance of the world is off. So we need people, we need volunteers to change that. And if we don't have that, we're not looking into a very positive future. If we do get that, I think we still can tip the balance and leave a planet that is one that we would want our kids or our neighbor's kids to actually live in. And I think that Greenpeace is on the front side, front run of trying to make that difference, of doing things that nobody else is brave enough to do of going up into the frontiers with our ships, but we're only as strong as, as our volunteers. So I would hope that the person would come in and join us. And if they don't join us, which I would love, that they just get active. It's not about, it's about everyone right yeah. now. It's yeah. really about everyone. And I feel really, I'm so excited and honored to lead Greenpeace, but you know, working with 350, working with all these different organizations, it's, if we, we need every person to, not be an armchair person, but actually get out and help. Excellent. Well, I think that's a good final statement. Okay, thank you great. very much for the interview. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was really, thank you. really it was interesting. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. And good luck. And